I love seeing so many familiar faces here. Um, raise your hand really quick if you were at the Open SSF Day event yesterday. Woo! Yeah. Thank you so much for coming. Oh, my heart. Ice cold. All right. All right. Um, Good morning, everyone. My name is Joy Burson. I'm a program director at the Linux Foundation, and I get to work with um, the Open SSF, which is an awesome community of security enthusiasts. Um, thank you, thank you, thank you all for, for joining us um, and kicking off this, uh, this track um, today. Before we get started with um, two days of, of awesome content, I think, um, that will really focus on like the, the how and the what and that sort of thing, we wanted to start with a panel that really dug into the why. Um, so, you know, it's not new uh, that we have security uh, issues in software. That's that's old news. Um, it's also kind of old news that we have big sort of F5 tornado-like events like um, log for shell or heart heart bleed. Those are uh, not uncommon. But what does seem to be kind of new, um, a, a new new wind, if you will is um, the shared interest and the shared focus of um, investing in security issues um, that's really taken a front and center stage as we saw this morning on the keynotes. Um, also sort of, uh, you know, the number of supply chain attacks that's definitely increasing a lot um, in, in our open source um, supply chain. So uh, we wanted to spend a time uh, this morning covering why the companies that um, are represented up here with me today, JP Morgan Chase, IBM, and Wipro, um, are uh, what they're doing and how they're addressing these very real and serious um, issues. So I'm going to address some questions to them and allow them an opportunity to introduce themselves, and then we'll have some time for Q&A. Uh, so uh, thank you again for joining us. And let me just get started with Jeff Borak here from um, IBM. IBM has been deeply, deeply involved in open source for 20 plus years, uh, so uh, that's uh, not new. Um, but uh, obviously, the investment and the uh, joining of the Open SSF, that sort of thing, is new. Why is IBM investing here now? Great. Well, um, Jory, thanks. Uh, happy to be here with the, my co panelists, and uh, thanks for uh, hosting this. Uh, IBM is investing in this because uh, I need to get a good night's sleep. <laughs> Uh, all kidding aside, um, I've been proud to be participating in a couple of different uh, ways in open source for over a decade at IBM. And uh, it's been something that um, when I talk about it, I say I stand on the shoulders of giants because IBM in the early days did a great job of both thoughtfully consuming as well as contributing back to open source in a, a meaningful way. And Part of that consuming was both a, a risk management from the legal perspective and intellectual property, paying respect to the license of the open source package, but also uh, reviewing the quality of that package and investigating it and doing some due diligence. And that persisted up until about uh, eight, 10 years ago. And IBM, like many, uh, entities started to get more comfortable with the, you know, open source is part of how we do business. And uh, the old classic Linus Torvalds quote of many eyes makes all bugs shallow. And because of that, IBM continued to focus on the legal risk. And that's currently today part of my responsibility of I, at IBM is helping to manage that process of reviewing the packages that we're consuming and the licenses and how things on the license landscape are shifting, which you have to pay attention to. Uh, but the fact that we weren't, uh, we distributed the responsibility for that security and code review to the various business units. And in doing so, we found inconsistencies. And then I started to have conversations with different colleagues in the industry comparing notes on this and quickly fig figured out that uh, this is really a systemic problem. It's a problem that's too big for any one company to solve. So I started lobbying passionately for IBM to participate in the uh, OpenSSF and was really thrilled to see it uh, 
reboot in the fall, and uh, happy to be here again today. Thanks so much, Jeff. Um, yeah, it's going to take an army to solve this problem, isn't it? Um, Rao, I'm going to go with you next. Um, we kind of can understand why a vendor like um, like IBM cares about this very deeply. They provide a lot of um, services. But in theory, banks don't distribute software. In theory, banks are not technology companies. But uh, I assume you, you would maybe in the past have paid a vendor like um, IBM or Wipro to solve these problems um, so you don't have to care about this. Why is J.P. Morgan Chase um, getting involved? First of all, thank you, Jory. My name is Raula Kakula. You guys can hear me in the back. Okay. So I'm executive director at JP Morgan Chase. I run teams focusing on building automated systems, which will make the developer platforms secure by default. And also I've been involved with securing the open source consumed by our developers, and also secured uh, the open source we contribute back to the ecosystem is secure. So to your question, Jory, like, why IBM is not solving all our problems. <laughs> Jeff, actually, why IBM is not solving our problems. <laughs> On serious no, note. No pressure, Jeff, no pressure. <laughs> On serious note, I wish we only use IBM, and IBM is the only vendor we ever used. Okay. And actually, and we don't, we don't develop any software in-house, and everything is taken care of IBM. I think actually IBM might like that idea. Um, <laughs> In reality, though, is we do have hundreds of vendors, small startup vendors to all the way giants like IBM, Microsoft, Google, Wipro, right? We have to deal with all the software coming into those. Moreover, as I mentioned yesterday in panel, we do have more than $50,000 in the bank. So it's actually not a bank, it's a gigantic tech company which actually serving the financial institution. That means we have thousands of developers committing code using hundreds and thousands of open source packages. We have closely half a million open source packages in our internal repository ready to use. So if you think that way, yes, we need to invest to keep our systems running um, without interruption, without vulnerabilities, by investing in the open source economy uh, ecosystem. Thank you, Rao. Um, Andrew, I want to bring Wipro into the conversation here as well. Um, so Wipro, your team has been um, really participating a lot lately in the working groups. Eric and Vicky are, are great additions. Um, um, and, in, and just increasing your engagement in open source. Um, naively, we would think that you'd be able to tell your comp uh, your customers that um, security is a, a vendor problem, um, not yours necessarily as the systems integrator, but I assume that the truth is a lot more nuanced than that. Um, what's, what's Wipro's um, like reason uh, for, for getting so actively involved in, uh, in security? Thanks, uh, yeah, and, and I, will, I will say it is not all IBM's fault. <laughs> okay, I just wanted to get that out there. It's yours too. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't say that. <laughs> Um, so for those of you who may not be familiar with us, we are one of the large global systems integrators, somewhere around 240,000 employees across the planet. Uh, I do, do lead open source uh, at Wipro. Um, what that actually means is a big part of our role that's, that's relevant for this conversation is our engagement with the communities and foundations. I think we're members and active participants in something like 12 or 13 Linux Foundation foundations and dozens of other communities. Uh, we probably have conservatively, I can't give exact numbers because we're public, but probably over 30,000 open source developers today uh, across the organization, and that's probably very conservative. Um, <clears throat> but why it's Im Im important for us, at the end of the day, it's trust. All right, that's one of the core pillars. My, my team is in the office of CTO, and that is one of the core pillars of, uh, of our CTO vision is building trust for our, in our clients. And in order to build trust, you have to be able to provide secure systems, right? And with the, the gaining, uh, with the continued incredible adoption of open source and the running of production systems everywhere, everywhere across the planet, you can't portray yourself as bringing trust and being a trusted partner to your customers without being involved in this ecosystem, right? So at the end of the day, that's really the, the bottom line. And yes, we, we do have a number of people who are active, but one of our commitments to uh, OpenSSF that we made during the uh, recent White House meetings is that 
we believe one of the values that we bring um, is the ability to, to uh, train our customers. So we are getting 100 of our cybersecurity team up to the level of train the trainer in, cyber, in open source cybersecurity training best practices, and we'll bring those, that knowledge to our, our global client base. That's one of the commitments that we're making besides getting involved with SIGSTORE and SALSA and the different working groups and so on. Um, I'm going to switch to the topic of education since you, you did bring it up, and, and each of you has sort of um, referenced the fact that you have thousands and thousands and thousands of de developers um, who either are working on security or need to be trained in security. Um, you know, what can our organizations be doing to help, um, you know, increase security education to encourage um, our, our engineers to go out and, like, l learn more and get... Um, uh, get get educated. I'll stay with the stay with you, Andrew. If you want to answer that, there's some really simple things out there. There are a bunch of different. There are a bunch of very basic uh, programs that are very either free or low cost. I mean, start with the L, the LF uh, LF security training suite. Right, that's one that everybody that is relevant in your teams should go through that. Second is, there are other, again, there are other simple courses like Udemy offers a whole bunch of them, as do a number of other uh, learning organizations and learning platforms. Just start there. Um, familiar, and it, it's not just with your cybersecurity team, right? We're going to talk about SBOMs, I'm sure, at, at some point in time uh, during this, this uh, panel. Uh, help your security team and procurement understand that's not something they need to get medicated against, <laughs> right? Help them understand what SBOMs actually are. Uh, and why they're important. We did a survey, we did an informal survey over the last couple of weeks. We reached out, we got 65 responses from large enterprises, both vendors and, and users uh, across, uh, across the globe. And it was just, what are SBOMs? What are you doing with SBOMs? Are you tracking them? And so on. Uh, of those, I think it was 64, 65 responses, only 12, and this is a self-selecting audience, right? Only 12 were actually asking for SBOMs. Of those 12, I think it was four or five were actually doing something with them. And then only, I think it was two, were actually putting them into a kind of a shared repository of information. And this was an audience that is already involved in this space. So if you think, if you extrapolate that uh, out across the, the global, I mean the wider global ecosystem here, the something as high profile as SBOMs still has almost no traction. We need to teach people that SBOM is not a four-letter word. That's what you're saying. Yeah. Um, IBM and, and JP Morgan Chase, you all also are, are doing a lot in the education space. Um, do you want to kind of maybe address Raoul and, and the importance yeah. of getting? Yeah, JPMC invests actually a lot on the security education and training over the years. But personally, I do believe you can't really separate security training from other training or software drum, right? We, we tried with this mandatory yearly security training, everyone hated it, right? So we, we gradually moving to it more like a reward and gamifying the systems, like make that as a fun event for them teams to learn about XSS issues, injection attacks, and we kind of give you this gold coin, whoever finds it quicker, that kind of, so making a gamify help. But you know what I think is that in, in-line training is always the better rather than a separated, right? We always have community groups on best practices for the architecture, scaling, resiliency. Why not security is a part of it? I think we had a lot more actually uh, success with embedding security as part of those. It's a, one of the qualities of your system. And then having that quick shot by training as in your inline processes seems to have worked better rather than a, a separate two-hour training you have to take like a, once a year. Yeah, that um, seems to be a theme that we talk a lot about in our um, best practices uh, working group where you know, we need to make sure that security education is not an afterthought the way so many like, you know, other, other types of training are. So uh, let's, let's dive into, oh, go ahead, Jeff. Well, I was just going to add uh, from an IBM perspective on this, it's one of the areas that IBM's trying to uh, push the boundaries a bit. Uh, how many of, I'm just curious, I bet it's going to be low. How many of the audience have heard of uh, the IBM P-TECH initiative? Only a few. Um, so one of the things that, again, systemic problems, not just in open source, but in the IT industry that we all need to collectively try and raise, raise awareness about. Um, 
if you think about the traditional computer science degree, there are all sorts of elements of getting a college computer science degree that set up in almost insurmountable barriers to individuals that are interested in careers in this space. And one of the ways that IBM tried to rectify that is create this concept of not, not just blue collar jobs and white collar jobs, but IBM's referred to this as kind of new collar jobs. And created a program called P-TECH where we actually look to reach out to uh, underserved groups uh, to get them interested in careers in technology as a fundamental, right? Now beyond that, uh, when the uh, White House uh, order on executive order on cybersecurity was issued back in the early part of last year, uh, IBM's response to that was we committed to create these cybersecurity centers in 20 historically black colleges and universities around North America. And that's currently in flight now. And what we're uh, doing collaboratively with Brian is we're looking to supplement that training that is focused largely on these cyber centers, but again, shift it to the left and leverage some of the content from the Linux Foundation with respect to educating developers on how to do this better and incorporating that into that program. So we're looking to do multiple things to increase the participation, increase diversity, and get security to be thought of is you know, more upfront rather than again the okay I've finished my project now what do I need to do to lock it down? So uh, I think Todd had a slide on that earlier and, and I felt that was tweet worthy. That's a really impressive program <laughs> frankly. Uh, but to something Rouse said earlier, what we've noticed something happening with our customers as this whole issue becomes more prevalent uh, is that all of a sudden people were, who were managers or directors or, or VP of DevOps all of a sudden are now managers, directors, and VPs of DevSecOps, mm. uh, right? <clears throat> and so those three letters are being inserted in, in their titles. And I've had a chance to actually talk to a few of these folks. And almost none of them have had additional training. They haven't necessarily had significant additional budget to add that sec capability to their teams. So it's, again, it, it goes back to training. It goes back to we, there are two segments to this whole ecosystem here. One are the, the vendors, the people who are already engaged, not necessarily a JP Morgan Chase or others, but if you look at the open SSF community or the open source community in general, it's made up primarily of vendors. We need to make sure that as we build these programs, we're actually addressing the end user consumers because those are the ones you're gonna have to change their behaviors more than just about any of the rest of us. So that's just something I want to get out there and make sure that we're targeting these programs also to the consumers. And that's a great point. And um, also I love the point on the DevOps to DevSecOps because I, I definitely have seen that as well. And, and kind of um, related is the, is the question of hiring and filling all of these um, roles now with a renewed focus on security. We've got a lot of uh, job openings. We've got job openings at uh, OpenSSF as well, if you want to head on over to the website. Um, <laughs> I need to plug that really quick. Um, so so uh, hiring has been probably very difficult, I imagine, for, for each of you in your organizations. How many roles are we really going to need to to fill when we talk about building that army to secure our open source supply chain? How many, how many roles um, uh, do we need to, to, to fill here well, to answer? Just on the IBM. Million. Front. Oh, I'm sorry. I One million, gonna... I would One say. <laughs> <laughs> well, sorry. just in that HPCU yeah. initiative, IBM committed to uh, training 150,000 just in a three-year period, and that's going to take you know quite a bit of effort to do. But that's just one example. It's going to take a sea change in the way people think about open source and uh, the way think about people think about software supply chains. Right? It's just. Security can no longer be the, oh, uh, I'll get to it at the end of the process. And there's not going to be one silver bullet that fixes things, right? We haven't got there yet, but we're going to talk about uh, the, the four-letter word, S-bomb. Uh, S-bomb doesn't stand for silver bullet. Yeah. And um, one of the things that IBM is trying to get out there is a lot of the people that are aware about S-bombs today are thinking about it as a compliance issue and not necessarily something that's gonna help me or help my customers issue. And the real value of SBOMS is not 
to get out there and publish your S-bomb, publish your S-bomb. I mean, that eventually is going to be mandated by government agencies around the planet. But well before that happens, I hope everyone's starting to learn about, get educated on, and begin to engage the constituents within your own organization. They're all going to have a say in what happens in trying to produce and then effectively use an S-bomb internally um, thoroughly before it ever sees the light of day. Because you're going to find out things that may surprise you when you finally assemble that S-bomb uh, list of materials. I, I agree with Jeff. I think it's, in my opinion, it's not just about hiring more security engineers, right? I think it's actually need to be a more collaborative approach so that everyone has to start contributing, understand that software supply chain security is important. So if actually, if, if any of the managers are in the room or watching this, or you can talk to the manager, even start contributing 10% of every developer time into the open source, open SSF projects, there are a ton of work streams. I think that's the only way we can improve the awareness and start thinking about that from the ground up. I mean, having security engineers definitely help, but I think we can make a bigger change by involving everyone. Um, you both have mentioned collaboration, and obviously OpenSSF is a place to do that um, collaboration. We have a whole mess of working groups. We dream up new ideas for working groups every day. Um, and, and your organizations have all been getting um, very deeply involved um, um, and we're working on a mobilization plan to start to address these problems even further. Um, I'm, I'm really curious how the activities that you're seeing kind of build out within OpenSSF mesh with your org's goals and strategies, um, you know, uh, moving forward. Andrew, do you want to? Sure. Well, we're making them mesh, right? Can't always say that they did before these efforts. Now we're making sure that they, they do mesh with our our other open source related initiatives. And I think that's really important for all of us because just, just on the panel and in the audience, we there's I'm sure there are contributors to hundreds and hundreds of different open source projects and foundations. We've got to take the knowledge that we're all gaining and the collaboration and efforts that we're all putting into the open SSF and other related activities and bringing those across our all of our entire open source portfolios. That's, that's a starting point. And so that's, for example, we've got our own open source security lab in Bangalore and we're making sure that we're creating, we're taking the best practices that we're either building or collaborating on with OpenSSF and bringing that across our entire ecosystem of projects that we engage with. So we get other people beginning to think about this because it's not, as we all know, it's, it's not at all prevalent or common in a variety of open source projects to, to just think about secure coding best practices and what that means. So there's a lot that we can do outside of our open SSF related activities. Yeah. Um, I think if you take any big company like JPM, CR, Wipro, or IBM with thousands of developers, it's like a mini open source ecosystem in there, right? We have to invest on security education. We need to identify what are the critical components in the company protecting them, which includes automatically detecting vulnerabilities, manually reviewing them. That com here comes the S-bomb there, too. But it's also uh, like even the providing these uh, best practices to all, to all the developers and mechanisms. So if you think all the way, the 10 plan works, uh, that mobilization plan we had last month, actually meshes with any other big company already working on those. So I do see that I think the JPMC priorities, like any other big company priorities, usually mesh with and align with what OpenSS are trying to do. And I'm, I'm super glad and proud to say that JPMC being like big supporter of OpenSS open from the beginning and premium members. So I think we are seeing that alignment more and more. Yeah, and I'd just like to second that because you know Alan and I, have a, an extra excuse to be up here, right? It's sort of, you know, we're the vendors on the panel. Um, but JPMC is a great example of progressive organizations that are adapting the, the way they engage with open source. You know, five years ago, JPMC might not have been up on this panel, but they've been one of a number of leaders that have realized that there's more value to be gained in open source than just sitting behind a subscription support or services or systems integration company um, and passively consuming it. 
they're still going to do that, thankfully for us. But uh, at the same time, they're going to selectively start to put their own engineering talent directly out into projects like this that are strategically important and meaningful for them. So uh, I'm hopeful. People have talked about, you know, will cloud, you know, negatively impact open source, and will it, you know, cloud um, cloud washing or no the Cloud washing, cloud, I like it. Cloud strip mining of you know open source was a thing, and I, I've been bullish on open source in part because I believe that other leading enterprises are going to join in what um, uh, JPMC has been doing. Let me re re reflect on that. I mean, you have you have one of the first vertical organizations now a member of the Linux Foundation in Finos, which is the fintech open source foundation, right? Set up to promote uh, open source and financial services, but. We see across the planet more and more and more end users are contributing back to open source, right? They're not just consumers anymore. But there's also still a high degree of immaturity or naivete within the large enterprise user consumer audience. Uh, there is one financial institution in Europe that, and obviously not remain nameless, um, in which they uh, twice a year, they send an email out to the developers they know of and say, would you mind please describing the open source you're using and how you're using it? You could imagine the response rate that they get to that. So it's a voluntary opt-in Excel-based tracking model, right, for a large financial institution. Now, they may be on one end of the spectrum, but it, it, you mentioned something about compliance earlier. Let's at least get them to start with compliance and then begin to introduce these other more sophisticated concepts, right, around what, do you, what can you do with SBOMs beyond that. Because right? they are, the average enterprise today, particularly in financial services, uses somewhere between 20 to 30,000 different open source components at any given time. And that number includes five to six to seven different versions of different open source components. So if you extrapolate that across the globe, it's a lot of open source, a lot of old legacy open source, uh, so let, let's, let's help these organizations start by getting compliant because that's something that uh, they, they're, many of them are willing to start with and then begin in introducing these other concepts. Now, I agree, but I, I would say that they're, they're fortunately motivated not originally by self-interest but by um, that cybersecurity executive order. So it's kind of like they never let a good crisis go to waste in some respects. Yeah, but how many people have actually positively already complied or responded to that executive order? I know of two software institutions that have been reached out to independently by the uh, appropriate federal agency saying we need you to be compliant um, within the next you know, few quarters. Other than that, it's, there's not a whole lot of investment being made to become compliant to the executive order today. I think one of the things that we are, are talking a lot about within the open SSF community is that balance between the carrots and the sticks to like encourage compliance. Um, and you know that's that's an active conversation. It's something we seem to be really um, uh, diving into as we work on the the ten point plan, which is this mobilization plan. It's available on our website if you'd like to go check it out, um, where we've kind of broken down needs across these ten work streams. Um, and uh, I'm curious to kind of talk a little bit about um, how your organizations are like getting involved and where the folks here and folks, <coughs> vendors um, like yourselves or um, companies like JP Morgan Chase, like where can they be sending uh, developers who want to sort of, um, you know, to, to get involved in, in OpenSSF um, work streams? Just to clarify, Jeff, I think, so JPMC actually had a long history of open source contributions 20 years back. We have advanced message uh, queuing protocol, MPQ is released to open source, and then recently the quorum. But I do agree with that. There's a lot more focus on actually contributing back to the ecosystem and security, though, just to clarify that. Um, to, your, to your question, Jody, I think, yeah, I think we, we are definitely interested in SBOM because that's how I think we're going to get more visibility into it. So there's, yeah. Uh, we are already working with FSSAC, Allen, and to understand the, how financial institutes can work together to kind of start work with our vendors to um, standardize the SBOM and consumption. We're also super interested in education because I said, like, we've been investing on this for years and learned a lot of on it. So yesterday announcement with David Willemette, that's actually great. I'm 
I would like to actually start collaborating on that one. And then also, we, over the years, we've been spending a lot of um, time on understanding how do we extract what is in each of the package. So some of the plugins we write to the Maven, um, JavaScript, those actually will align with some of the work stream work we do with the SBOM open source tooling. So I'm happy to, um, to collaborate on those from JPMC. Uh, I want to, one thing I try and communicate to our younger developers, uh, the ones coming out of university, uh, lurking is not a bad word in software, in open source projects, right? So if you don't feel confident getting involved, which is fine, many, many or most of us don't when we first start getting involved, just be there, show up at the meetings, you know, follow the Slack channels, do all those kinds of things just to get comfortable. So. I really encourage our, our younger developer community to just start and getting involved at the most basic level. And then it's much, it happens much faster than they expect that all of a sudden they make a comment or they contribute some code or they write a little documentation. And they find it's pretty cool. Now we hire a lot of uh, offshore developers, obviously it's not necessarily in their culture to, to do that, and that's, so that's why we just try and say, start by, you know, if you want, just lurk for a few, be on a few calls, uh, be on a few channels, and then begin contributing when you're ready. I think that's one of the most important messages, rather than saying you need to have X number of contributions within the next 90 days, right? That message doesn't resonate, we found. Actually, all our work, work stream meetings are public and available for anyone to join. Yeah, the other thing I would add to that, uh, I was just on a call earlier this morning with an IBM client, uh, a tax authority in the, the EU, and uh, I was really encouraged by that call, and as I was on it, I was thinking about this panel, because the other element, you're right, you've got to get started, you've got to kind of start to lean in, but you also need to uh, start to develop your constituency within the organization, right, because it's it can't you know, one group can kind of try and spearhead it, but it's, it's going to take your, your legal organization within your entity to be up to speed on what's going on here and understand the role that they're going to play. It's going to take your senior leadership to more fully appreciate what's happening in the software supply chain and how it's going to affect their business. It's going to take your, your software developers and engineers, and it's also going to take your product or service teams to all, and, and that's just a subset of some of the major groups that need to have a seat at the table as you start to approach this issue. And I just want to add one group uh, to what Jeff's saying is procurement. I, I see procurement as being one, one of the biggest gates to SBOM adoption uh, in, in the future. So you have to get them involved and get them engaged and help them understand why it's important to be requiring that of their suppliers. Can you elaborate on that gatekeeping? What's motivating them to do that? Well, and they're not doing it on, I don't necessarily know that they're doing it on purpose. It's just a lack of knowledge, right? They don't need, they don't know why they should be asking for S-bombs. They're not told to be asking for S-bombs. They're not, they don't share with, uh, their, their suppliers, what information they actually want. They don't know how to select a format, right? So it, it's just a lack of knowledge. It's not, be, I, I don't necessarily see them putting up a gate on purpose. It, it is an interesting dynamic though, because what you think about is you start to realize, well, wait a minute, I've got to produce an S-bomb. You know, what is that gonna take? What am I gonna need to do? And then the second light bulb goes on. I need to get S-bombs from all of my vendors. Yes. Because, Current. Uh, Current. Right, and well, uh, not just current, but uh, I mean anything, right? Because yeah. it's just like you're gonna uh, you're gonna get a lot of pushback from your vendor community initially. They're gonna go, "What? You right. you want? I've never delivered this before. Do I have to? Well, Is it mandated know, yet?" They won't know. IBM knows what they are, right? Right. Smaller software suppliers, smaller ISVs, startups. They won't even know what it is, much less what needs to be in it. So um, security obviously is a full-on team sport. I think we have an awesome team here at the Open SSF, um, and we've got just about five more minutes, and I do want to leave room for maybe one or two questions. So my last question to the panelists will be, um, you know, is there a project or an effort underway at Open SSF that you would like to um, sing or highlight um, for the audience today um, as, a, as a favorite or an unsung hero, as Brian says? 
I think uh, the open CRE project, uh, Rob is actually leading, that one I really like it. It's actually taking all the regulations, all the standards into more common format develop. It makes it developers to understand what to do, which will meet all these regulations. I think that one I would like to see more getting popularity. Then obviously the, the SBOM work stream, one of the 10 we're coming, like there is actually work, I think we haven't started yet, the work stream to build the open source tool which automatically generate the SBOMs for the most common package managers. That would be super helpful for adoption of SBOM yep. for vendors. It's so easier to ask a small vendor saying, just use these tools to do rather than explaining them what is SBOM, what to do. Uh, to that, I guess I would add, um, uh, I'm bullish on SIGSTOR. Uh, it's still early, but um, it's a project that uh, I think is going to become increasingly important as this starts to mature. And beyond that, the thing I would add, though, is I think we are in a critical inflection point in our own little emerging community in that you know, we started out two years ago, pan pandemic hit, no real funding, kind of a best efforts basis. And then we've done this reboot now in the fall, and we've got great momentum, and we had the recent White House meeting. Uh, I, it's time, I think, you know, to take the working groups that we had and the expanded scope of the recent paper and rapidly consolidate that into a new cohesive mission that everyone's on the same page with. I would, use, I would just use the word refine, similar to consolidate. There's, you said mess at the beginning. <laughs> well, um, she, she mispronounced um, uh, variety, I think. Variety, yes. No, no, I don't think she did <laughs> <laughs> at all. Um, it's complicated. I mean, getting new people involved, trying to help them figure out where to get engaged, help them pick the right projects, work streams, and so on. It is complicated. And to your point, Jeff, really need to consolidate the 10-point plan with the current work streams, right? Um, I know there's a new best practices working group last week, um, and that should, there's a lot of time and energy should, should go into that. We have to get the, we have to figure out what the knowledge is that we're going to share. We have to get it out there as quickly as we can, uh, not just to help people get up to speed, but to also bring more people into uh, these, these different activities. Uh, I'd also say SIGSTOR, we're huge fans. Um, spend time there, uh, but best practices. So, yeah, <laughs> Groves, yeah, yeah. Um, we have maybe two minutes. Is, are there any questions from the audience or from our virtual attendees, um, burning questions for the panelists today? Uh, yes, in the, in the black shirt back there. Uh, I'm sorry, I heard six door. Let's repeat the question for the uh, virtual attendees. So the, the spirit of the question is, um, how does SIGSTOR and SBOM really, I think, um, level up security um, beyond just being another task um, for, for the developer? So I, I think your point, uh, if, if you're looking for helping establish a certain level of security, maybe salt, the SALSA framework is something to pay more attention to initially. So make sure you're, you're at SALSA level one and, and moving forward. So maybe for your organization, SALSA is, is, a, is a more important first step. And then what was the second part? Yes. I think there was S-bombs. Yes. Yeah, S-bombs, yeah. Um, yeah, so not many people are actually even asking for them today uh, or have the ability to analyze what's in them by the right people or to compare them with other S-bombs that they're getting. So first thing is in your organization, again, I'm just going to hit on, on knowledge. Second, creating a database, right, where you can actually be, you can actually share and compare the information between SBOMs. Uh, but train people on, under how to, to actually just review them and look at them, right, because there are lots of organizations that do get SBOMs generated by, say,
say a black duck or white source or a fossa, right, or, uh, or others, but they don't necessarily do much other than look at, uh, look at it from a compliance perspective. Uh, just to add to that, I think it just makes it easier to do the security task. Like six store, you don't need to maintain the private keys anymore. It does help you with that. So I think it, in a way, it's not really anything new. It just makes the, what we need to do a lot easier. So I regret that we are out of time for, uh, I just got the big red stop sign, um, but I want to encourage you all to come to um, OpenSSF working group meetings, get involved. We have, um, if you have additional questions for the panelists, um, either find them here or um, come on to slack.opensf.org and ask them in our Slack channel. Um, yes, Jeff. Well, I just want to leave you all with one thought and a quick plug. Uh, the one topic we really didn't get to, and the only way we're really going to get out of here is through future uh, automation and artificial intelligence, because this is a problem at scale, and it's we can't hire enough people to figure our way out of this. Um, and come to my session on Thursday. <laughs> <laughs> Nicely done. Uh, thank you all for coming. I hope you have a great rest of your Supply Chain Security Con, and thanks again to the virtual attendees. Thank you, George.